good to have all of you here. You're all looking good. Turn to your neighbor and say you're looking good. Husbands and wives, I would highly recommend that. you would to Romans chapter 12 in verse 1. Good afternoon, good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. God is your good to us, isn't he? And I'm going to read just the beginning part of that verse. And I'm not going to keep you long. Okay, I promise you that. I know you've heard that story before. Oh, yeah. uh, Romans chapter 12, beginning part of verse 1 says, I beseech you. And let's pray, shall we? Lord, I love you so very much. Thank you, Jesus, for your word today. God, I pray that you will just, Lord, just speak, just speak to each and every one of you. We need you so very much. There is a hunger inside of us, Lord, that, that you would be able to do a work in us. Thank you, Lord, for what I feel in this sanctuary today. That desire, Jesus, that you would have your way in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will just move, that your anointing will be in this place. God, that you will touch each and every one in this year. Lord, that you will draw each and every one of us closer to you today. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Say that. Enjoyed teaching this last Tuesday. Uh, mentioned I haven't haven't taught here in just about a year, I guess it is. And uh, so, for those of you that thought I was a bit rusty, uh, those are the reasons. And uh, uh, hopefully, with uh, with practice, I'll get better, right? No, oh, really quiet. Oh, you're listening. Oh, well, that's a good thing too. I want to talk to you today about uh, about Paul's uh, way that he addressed people and the way that he preached. And uh, to some extent, I want to focus in on just what I just read to you at the beginning of Romans chapter 12 and what he says here at the very beginning. He says, I beseech you. It's actually what I entitled this message, I beseech you. Uh, Paul's approach to... Uh, to dealing with various individuals was often very um, different. And when you start reading Paul's letters or you go through the book of Acts and you look at, at how he addressed people and how he dealt with things, there are times it appears like that he may have been a little bit hard. And then there's times that it looks like he, you know, when he, and we'll talk about this a little bit when he talks about grace, mercy, and the love of God. That you're thinking, man, this guy is like, you know, he's he's on one side at one moment and he's on the other side at the other moment. And uh, and then we, depending on our personalities, we pick and choose which side we like the best. You know, we're, we're looking at grace and mercy. That's all I want to read is just about grace and mercy. And if we're the type that, uh, you know, likes a more clear direction in our lives and maybe more discipline, uh, we may go to some different writings of, of that Paul had and apply those to our lives and try to apply those to other people's lives. Uh, can I tell you, first of all, that, uh, that when God speaks to you from his word, it's generally for you, not for somebody else. And, uh, and that when God gives you something, it's generally because God is trying to address something in your own life. Uh, we have a tendency to want to make that applicable to everybody else's life. How many of you know that you're at various stages of coming to God? Yeah. And in your relationship with God. And so my relationship with God, if God's dealing with me with a certain issue from His Word, doesn't necessarily apply to you. So I've got to be hungry enough uh, for what God has for me. And then I've got to be sensitive enough as a pastor that I know when God's speaking to me about something that I need to address the congregation and God's people about. So it's kind of a complicated process. But Paul dealt with so many different things. We find that when he came before kings and uh, the governors of his day and age, that he was very straightforward. And uh, we would like to have had uh, Paul deal maybe in a more gentler manner with those that he was preaching to. 
And oftentimes he did. When he stood before kings, he would basically tell them uh, that they were wrong. And that they needed to change their way of living, the way of serving God. And so he was very, very straightforward. He, he preached about righteousness and judgment to come and temperance. Uh, and, uh, and he just said it like it was. I want to encourage all of you that have the Holy Ghost here today that you speak plainly to people. Because we live in a day and age where sin has become a gray area in our world. And sin is no longer sin anymore. It's just a different lifestyle, a different way of living, a different preference. And, uh, but according to the Word of God, sin is still sin. And unless there is a realization and an understanding of sin in people's lives, there is never any need to feel like you need to repent. And so, uh, when we're dealing with people, and I'm not saying you need to be harsh or you need to be so blunt that you're, you're actually turning people away. I've known people like that, and I don't think that that's the way that we need to be. But we do need to be plain enough that, that, uh, that sin is still sin. God doesn't change. And uh, when he wrote down in his word what things displeased him and what things were contrary to his word, contrary to his commandments, contrary to his character, contrary to his nature, God meant exactly what he said. And God is not going to change to please you. Right. Everybody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like it or not, he's God. And, and you may want to be God of your own life, but, uh, but the end result is God is God. And so he has pretty much the right to make the choices the way that he does. And so we find out in, in God's word that, that the various individuals that God moved upon to write our Bible as we see it now, they oftentimes went to various areas of address to talk to people so that they would be able to, I would think, influence all different segments of their society. Paul said it this way, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And so for some, he addressed them gently, he addressed them in love, he addressed them about mercy and grace. For others, it seems like he was a little bit more direct. In dealing with the Corinthian church, you will notice that, that the sin that was going on in that church in 1 Corinthians, that Paul addressed it so bluntly that he told that church to excommunicate them. To put them out of the church and that they were to have nothing to do with them for a time. Then in 2 Corinthians we read that Paul advocated that because repentance had happened in their lives that they were to bring them back in again. And so for those of us that find that a bit harsh, uh, it was probably exactly what these people needed in order to find that place of repentance. Can you imagine if they were coming to church and they were made to feel like it was okay to live in sin and still be considered to be God's child and, and just continue in that sin without the need for repentance? So Paul addressed that very, very plainly, very directly. With the Galatian church, and you will, how many of you read through Galatians? Regulation. You will know, notice that Paul deals with grace and he deals with mercy at the beginning part of that. And it's probably the greatest book that we have written in the New Testament where Paul talks about grace and mercy. Grace is for each and every one of us. Grace is there because God understood our humanity. He understood our need for that grace to be in our lives. And uh, all of us have had to have, make that grace or that that, that actually the area of grace for each one of us, we've got to access that for our own lives. And uh, for those of you that have erred in the kingdom and, and then come back and repented and asked God and confessed your sins, you will know that that grace is there for each and every one of you. Amen. And in Paul's life, uh, the word of the Lord came to him and said that that grace that God had for his life was sufficient. There was a sufficient amount of grace for everything in his life. Some of us have felt from time to time that we have stepped beyond God's ability to forgive us. And I just tell you right now that if there is any sort of desire in you to, to want to please God, to want God to be a part of your life, that you have in no way stepped beyond that area where God is able to forgive, God is able to restore you, so that He wants you to be in where you should desire to be. 
So the Galatian church, but then at the end of the, the letter to the Galatians, Paul's talking about living in the Spirit, and he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and then he lists off all the works of the flesh, you know, all of those things that are listed there, those bad things, you know, uh, envy, you know, adultery, various things along the way, and he talks about all of those things. And then he says this at the end of it, he says, any of you know, those that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom. So he goes from talking about grace and mercy, and he goes to this area where he talks about the works of the flesh, and he says, if you're continually living in these things, you will not inherit it. Yeah. And because those things are continual action things, uh, you, we've got to remove ourselves from those ways of living so that we may inherit the kingdom. And of course, God is so merciful, he allows us room to repent and get ourselves right again. Aren't you glad for that today? Yeah. Amen. Uh, you will notice that uh, uh, that Paul wrote probably the greatest letter on the aspect or the, the, the subject of love that we have written in the New Testament. And I've often wondered at the difference in the way that he wrote. But, but when it comes to this particular chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he talks about all the different aspects of love, we will almost inevitably use that in virtually every marriage ceremony that we do. Because it is so applicable to what is going on at that time. Uh, I'm amazed at it. I have found myself in reading it and doing marriage ceremonies that, uh, that oftentimes I have found myself falling short in the way that I love people. And I've had to change some of the ways that I've dealt with people. I've heard people in the last while uh, justify being unforgiving, justify being a little angry, justify maybe being a little hateful. And even those that are living for God. And yet when you read that 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you find out that there is no provision in love for you not to forgive. Yeah. There's no provision in love for you to hold grudges. There's no provision in love for you to want your own way over somebody else's way. But the provision that Paul gives us in love is that we would sacrifice and give of ourselves for those that we care for. We need to care for each other. We need to love each other enough that we're not going to hold to the things that, that seem to have offended us over time to the detriment of the body of Christ. Everybody say amen. amen. But Paul begins to deal with the churches and talks in different ways. And then he comes to this one part, and he says it numerous times in his writings, where he says, I beseech you... Therefore, brethren, the passage of scripture that we read in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he goes on to talk about what he's beseeching them that they would do. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And this particular word is a strong word. It's not uh, just I'm asking you. Um, we try and teach our children to say please, right, as they're growing up. You know, we don't like it when they demand things of us. And so when they ask for something, we would say, what's the magic word? And so you make your children say, please. At least that's the way it worked when I was child. That's the way it worked when I was raising my children. And my wife was always probably much better at it than I was. I'm pretty soft on my grandchildren. <laughs> much softer than I should be. Right, Kaya? Did you <laughs> Did I get an amen from <laughs> And so, but, but uh, I will be reminded that I need to apply those same principles to my grandchildren as I did to my children when they were growing up. And, uh, but we try, but this is not just an asking, oh, can I, can you pass the, the button, please? This is not just asking somebody to do something because really if you ask them, they should do it. This goes a whole step above just asking somebody to do something. What Paul is saying when he uses the word beseech, he is using a word that would imply that he is getting down on his knees and he's pleading and he's begging with them to do the things that he's, he's placed within the scriptures at that point in time. Now I ask myself, well, why would he be so adamant about, about these things and not so uh, adamant about other things? And I, the only thing that I can come to is the fact that when Jesus said these words, verily, verily, I say unto you. How many know the reason why he did that? For emphasis. For emphasis. 
This is important. What Jesus is saying when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, what it means is you better pay attention. This is really important. He's emphasizing that. So I think that Paul, in his writings as well, whenever he uses the word that I beseech you, he's using that as a way of emphasizing and saying to all of us, this is important for your lives. How many know it's important to live for God? Amen. Amen. And uh, there may be other things that he can talk about that may be, may be less on the level of importance for us to be able to do or, or they're probably going to be part of our growth process in living for God. But when Paul says, I beseech you, he means, I want you to pay attention to what I'm having to say to you right now. This is really important. And rather than command you to do this or command you to change, this is something that you're going to have to do voluntarily, but I'm begging you and pleading with you that you will do this in your life hard for us. It's hard for us to give our lives to God. The way that God wanted us to and the way that Paul is begging us to. We want so very much to, to run our own lives. It's difficult for us to give up control. Well, I want to make my own decisions. I want to have control of my life. And the hardest thing we we do sometimes we, you know, there used to be a saying back when I was growing up in God that that God wants to be your co-pilot. And, uh, and I, you think about that, and it's all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're supposed to be the pastor. God's supposed to be the pilot. Yeah. He's the one that's supposed to be in control. I'm not in control of this. God is. And so when Paul asks us to do something, when he's begging and beseeching us to do something, we need to sit up and take notice that this is important in our lives. These are important issues. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We talk about three things that Paul beseeches us to do. First of all, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 uh, goes along with that, and I'll paraphrase this just a little bit. It says, Walk or conduct your lives so as to please God. I, I want this to abound and to grow in you. I want you to keep growing in your ability to, to conduct your lives so your lives please God. Now, how many of you, when you first came to God, says, God, here I am? And he says, God, I want you to use my life. I want you to take my life. I want you to change my life. I want you to fill me with the Holy Ghost so that my life can be in victory and, and all of that. And then as we went through the process, you know, there's, there's always that first honeymoon period, right? And then God begins to deal in our lives about some of the ways that we've been living and some of the things that we've been doing. And we come to that place is at odds with what God desires for us. But Paul in his, in his talking in Ephesians and to the Thessalonian church as well, says, I want you to live your lives so as that you may be able to be an evidence or an epistle to those that are without that I am the one that is in control of your lives. This goes so against some things that are taught and preached nowadays in regards to how we should live our lives. But Paul definitely, when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that I want you to live your lives as though that calling was the most important thing to you. You see, all of us have been called. All of us should be living for God. And uh, we should be doing it in such a way that others will be able to see Jesus Christ in us. And not only in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, I not only want you to walk that way as to please God, but that this would have found or that it would grow in you. Second point is that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 goes along with that. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offense is contrary to doctrine, which ye have learned, and avoid them. So the second part of what Paul is beseeching us, first part is to walk according to the vocation and callings that God has placed in our life. The second part of that is, is that we would be able to have unity one with another. That we would be speaking the same thing. 
that we wouldn't look for ways that would divide, but rather we would look for ways that would unite us. That we would be united in doctrine, that we would be united in purpose, that we would be in one mind and one accord. And when we go back to the way the early church was, I want you to know one of the main aspects of that church and the reason that God moved so powerfully is that they were in one mind and one accord. The Bible says that on the day of Pentecost that there was no division. They were all together in that one place. Yeah. And their minds were one. And their purpose was one. And all of a sudden in that place the Holy Ghost fell. And all of those that were there in that upper room, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost as God filled them. And they spoke in tongues as God gave them the utterance. So God wants us to be in unity. God wants us to love each other. If there is division in this church today, if there is some way that, that is hindering you in your relationship with each other, I want you to know that it is the will of God today that you reach a place of forgiveness. Amen. It is the will of God today that you be able to go to that individual and you either apologize or if that person comes to you that you forgive so that there might be unity within the house of God. Amen. I believe that we all need to be in one mind and one accord when it comes to our desire to see the law saved. That's right. I think it should be that all of us are, are working together to reach the laws around us. That it shouldn't be left up to one person or our, our outreach department, but each one of us would be so involved in outreach that it would be an integral part of our lives. Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. The last one, of course, is the passage of scripture that I read to you from Romans chapter 12. This passage of scripture from the very first time that I came to God some 30 some odd years ago. Uh, has always affected me. Any time that I've read it, it's just touched me. And uh, I'm going to be closing with this particular point from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, brethren, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which it is your reasonable service. I want to ask you a question today. I don't care how short a time or how long a time you've been serving God. When was the last time you came and you just got down on your knees and an altar? And you said, God, here I am. I want to give myself to you all over again. I remember doing this back when I first came. And there's been a few times, Lord, during the, the time that I've been living for you where I felt that need again in my life to do that. The times that we live in, the danger of our day and age, the Bible says that in the latter days, perilous times will come, is going to require of us, those of us that are here and those of us that desire to be God's, sacrificing these are bodies so that God can use us. I'm not altogether sure for you what that's going to entail. For I don't know altogether what God's going to be asking of you. What area of ministry God wants you to move in. What area of the world God wants you to go to and minister. I don't know whether it's going to require of you in this city for, for you to fulfill that part of it. But I know sacrifice is difficult. I know it's hard for us. It was hard for them back then, too. They actually had to take a sacrifice from things that they had raised. If they were shepherds, they would have to bring that sheep. If they didn't, if they had another occupation, they would have to pay for it. They would have to bring it. And then they had to present it to God and they had to leave it there. So when Paul is mentioning this in this passage of scripture. This is not a frivolous verse. It's not something that you can take or leave hope to do it sometime in your life and then stop doing it another time in your life. This is something that Paul felt like was essential to our walk with God. Essential to our relationship with Him. We can sacrifice and we can give up our bodies to a lot of different I've seen people do it for their work, their careers, their jobs, to the detriment of their families 
And can I tell you the day honestly that I was at that point before I came to God? That my wife will talk about these times before I came to God and about me being gone all the time because that was all there was in my life. That was the most important thing. We can give and we can sacrifice our, our bodies to habits and addictions. And all of you have known people that have done that in our lives. We can sacrifice our bodies and give them over to a relationship that maybe shouldn't be as opposed to the one who wants to have that relationship with us so very much. Let's stand as the musicians come, shall we? Paul says that when we make this sacrifice, it should be holy and acceptable unto God. And then he says this at the end of the passage of Scripture. He says, which is your reasonable service? It's just reasonable. The Amplified says this is the intelligent thing to do. The rational thing to do. It's to give your lives to God. Give your body to sacrifice to Him. And then he says this. Not only is it our rational and intelligent thing to do, but it is also spiritual worship. It's an interesting part of that scripture in the Amplified. Because you see, we sometimes think of worship as lifting our hands, talking to God. We sometimes even confuse worship with praise and we think that it's noisy. We think that it has to be loud. And really the two are very different in the way we approach God. Worship, spirit, true spiritual worship is this. It is coming to that place where we have bowed our knees before God. And we say, Lord, I want to give you everything. Not just the portions that are easy, but I want to give you every part of my life right now. Now, the Bible says, Jesus said, that the Father is looking for those that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. When we come to God with this, Lord, I want you to take every part of my life and I want you to use it. If God is seeking for anything today, He is looking for His people that are willing to say those words and say them honestly. God's attention stops and it becomes focused on one who feels and says those words. There is a need in our generation, in our time, for people like Paul, Peter, and James, and Stephen, and all of those back at the beginning of this dispensation of time that gave up their lives so freely for this gospel. I'm never going to preach to you a message that doesn't require sacrifice. For sacrifice is an essential, it's a part of what God desires for our lives. Yeah, we can give up our time, we can give up our money, do all of those things that routinely that we do in working for the king. But what God really desires today is someone that comes and says, Lord, here I am. I want to give you my life. Hallelujah. Is there anybody? Wants God, wants God to use them so fervently that you're willing to come to this altar and say, Lord, you're right. I'm not going to fuss, Lord. I'm not going to fight. I just want you to use me, and I want to just rededicate my life to you again. Give myself to you the way that I know that you desire me to. There's no reservation. Nothing held back. No part of my life. Myself. God.
God has every portion of my life will ever do. This altar is open if you want to come. Just talk to God and present yourself to Him. That He would use you. That you'd be a conduit for His mercy and His grace and a door by which God can reach into somebody else's life. This altar is open.